long before boats controlled the waters. A moat of some vastness known as the sea made our island fertile ground for curious minds and big imaginations to grow wild, unchecked and in splendid isolation. Magical thinking blossoms in these darker conditions. And it was the fine art of storytelling that the shapeshifters among us used to set the twilight reading and keep the black blackness at bay. The words that kept us warm were nuggets of narrative gold that became currency once the boat started sailing in the other direction. Off we went with our bags of words and our unique ways of putting them together. If there was a dream to be dreamt or a tale to be told, we could play the Joker or serve all the aces. The sea is a good metaphor for the tale we have to tell. The artistic route to the waterfall is never straight nor simple. There is no one pathway. But when the will is strong, water always finds its way. In this film, we speak to 10 Irish artists who have navigated their way through stormy waters, buffeted by vagabond winds, to reach calmer shorelines and bring home the jewels. We have no care for speed, location or weather reports. We're only looking for the flow. No one else was in the office from Dublin and there was a new punk rock show called The Lockup. And the producer at the time liked the way that I said punk. I feel like music is actual real life magic. Yeah. You know, it is, it is it's something that kind of came before humans. Like it, it, it's never not been there. It's always been there in some form, whether it's the kind of beating of your heart or whatever. Yeah. Um, it, it, if, if you think about it too much, it just kind of it makes my brain explode. But yes, the, the essential aspect of music is that it touches your emotions like nothing else can. Um, it can make you feel. It's that idea that you're getting people out of their present and, and taking them somewhere else. Um, hopefully somewhere better, but sometimes sadder or, you know, memories or nostalgia. But yeah, I do feel that like music has this innate power to uh, tap in to your brain like no other art form does. Malmo is Sweden's third biggest city and close enough to Copenhagen to chuck things at. No one ever does this. Curiously, it is also home to the largest living collection of underground Irish musical artists anywhere in the first world. Good time, John. Matty Bulger and Richie Egan from the Redneck Manifesto all live and work in the city. With two Swedish children on hand to say, hey, hey, at the drop of a hat, Richie Egan, also known as Jape, was our light and guide through a perfect autumnal afternoon. It's a, it's a much more sort of solitary existence over here you know there's not so much people that I know uh, there are some people but mainly it's I spend a lot of time I can, I can spend a lot of time just focusing without having to worry too much about the, meeting people on the street etc when you're undertaking to write there's a certain amount of time where you have to sort of like be like a deep sea diver where you actually you're not particularly writing as such or whatever you're just you're getting down to the place where you will begin to write. And that sort of decompression zone of, of getting into that mindset, it's much easier for me to do it here, you know? Yeah. Because... Because it's a solitary thing. Yeah, it's, it's, you, have to, you have to have a certain amount of... If you want to progress any art, I think you have to have a certain amount of deep thinking. Yeah. And in order to have deep thinking, you need, you need time. And you need solitude and you need no distraction. Yeah. Over here, it's a case where I drop the kids to crash in the morning and then I have from say eight or nine until like three or four in the afternoon where I basically I'm stopped on the internet and I'm just thinking and it's it's, it's a really great feeling to, to have that where you kind of feel like you've, you've made connections in your own brain and you surprise yourself as well you know. 
For some reason, I, I see this kind of pattern emerging where I'll make something and then I kind of don't make anything for a while and try and uh, like uh, get to the point again where uh, I can feel like I'm kind of surprising myself, you know? Yeah. And that's been happening in the last while, which has been, it's been a really great feeling because the fear that I had that I would never get it again, uh, that's it's kind of gone away now. So I'm in this case where I'm just writing all the time now and it's like, it feels good, you know? But I, I'm also old enough to realise that, that that's part of a cycle, you know? Yeah. So this is why I, I think it's best when you're a bit older. That when you're younger, sometimes you kind of tend to almost take that for granted and you, you don't milk the opportunity as much as you should. But now that I'm older, I'm milking the shit out of this fertile time yeah. and really trying to get as much as I can out of it. And it's cool. For me as, as an artist, I find these particular threads that I find interesting, right? And I kind of, I, I'm like, oh cool, now I can say this because it sounds interesting to me, right? Yeah. And then it becomes harder as you get older to, to find those things to say. But now, like you say, I'm looking back at the naivety of some of the stuff I was doing when I was just starting out yeah. and realizing that that's, that's actually the source of the good stuff, you yeah. know? And that, that, I think you run from naivety when you're an artist, and, yeah. but you always come back around to it again. Well, the good thing that happened to me was I was make, I've been making like music for a cartoon, you know, and what that has done, uh, it's enabled me to, now that that's finished, I've been able to actually disconnect from the whole music scene, no matter where it is, Ireland, anywhere, and really think about what, if you're going to make music now, what do you want to say, you know, and like, uh, it's got to be, for me now, it has to be a completely pure expression of that source you know and in the past that source has been in there but I've all it's also been sullied by me going shit I need to get this song I need to song to do well or whatever and now I feel so free that I don't I'm, I don't care about that now yeah. so with the songs I'm letting them breed I'm not trying to constrain them I'm just yeah. going with it. and it's an amazing feeling of almost like being led yeah. by them and again just not thinking about it and coming up with I think really good stuff there's always music in the house and then uh, yeah, got at the age of 14, got a bass guitar uh, from my junior cert results. And that was the end of that then, that was it for me, you know. And in a way, it's like, very lucky to find something like here. That's all I can, all I could ever do and all I ever wanted to do was that. One song literally changed my whole life. Smells Like Teen Spirit yeah. changed my whole just everything went, boom, okay, yeah. there we go. Then I found out about all the, I found out about this underground scene in America, you know, this like Black Flag and the Dead Kennedys, Minor Threat, that they're all releasing their own records and going on tour. And it's just like, this is before the internet. So, so such an alien thing to me. And so like a magical Shangri-La type, wow, yeah. that'd be it's so great. Imagine sleeping on people's floors and like <laughs> playing to like 20 people and robbing right. food from a deli and shit like that. And, it was so romantic you to me. You get to do all that. You know, get to do it all. Like the 20 people every single I'm, night I'm, if you want. When, when I moved to Malmo first, I really h hated to be here yeah. for a few years, you know. And, it, it and how, really, how did that manifest itself? It manifested itself just through me just not wanting to be here, you know. Yeah, yeah. Wanting to leave, constantly trying to see how we could leave, but never actually making a proper, proactive steps to actually leave, just sitting around moaning basically, so, like, getting you, depressed. You, you were touring and you were playing with Japen and you come back and every time you come back, you, you don't like coming back. This was happening Initially, for years, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, I really, I wanted to be in Dublin so much that I kept yeah. going back all the time and I still go back an awful lot compared to a lot of people who are here. Yeah. But what's happened now is that I've re I realized, and this has been a very free, liberating experience, is that it's really just about what's in my head. You yeah. know? And the work. Yeah, the work. And in terms of that, Malmo's way better. Like we spoke about, Malmo's actually way better yeah. because there's nothing really else to do apart yeah. from that, you know? The work now has to be good enough to justify being here. Yeah. So Malmo now is working as a sort of a, it's sort of like a, it's like it's kind of almost daring me to make yeah. really good work. Otherwise, I'll be, why the fuck am I here, you know? Yeah. So that's in that sense, it's really cool uh, to be here at the moment because it really, I want to, to milk yeah. that. And before, when I did the last record, I, I, I was, I can say I was very, I was quite sad, yeah. you know? And I was trying to milk the, that isolation to try and make myself feel not sad. Yeah. But this time, I don't really feel sad. I feel more like, it's almost like, fuck you now. I'm gonna now yeah. take this and really take it. Yeah. And that's what Malmo offers me, you know? 
as I said, I didn't write anything for ages, and this was all, all of this this environment was shaping me in some way, yeah. you know. But now in the last while, it's just been like a switch has gone in my head where I'm just tapped into that now. So now I don't need any of this. I just need to be there with yeah. my my stuff. And yeah, yeah. I'm finding it so easy now, yeah. you know. It's almost like it's so. So it's really crazy. It's irrelevant, it's irrelevant, yeah. irrelevant now, yeah, yeah. you know, it's irrelevant. But it took me, a, I think this environment shaped me to the point when I could get to there, okay. you know? Okay. And that was hard, that was so hard it does, So it does, inevitably, it does change you in some way. Yeah, t totally. It's, it's, and it is, because even when I wasn't writing, like I go for a run in this graveyard yeah. and it is quite, it's quite, uh, it's, it's a nice place, you know? It's a good, yeah. this part, Mama, is pretty yeah. nice. And uh, yeah, I think, I think for me, it's, it's at the moment, it's, it, I do, it could be anywhere. I yeah. don't mind anymore, you know. Yeah. And make it really, really. It's coming. It's coming really good, you know, at the moment. Yeah. Um, so. There's a gate here. The metabolism of Swedish life yeah. is slower than the Irish metabolism. Really. In terms of like, just it seems to me like everything over here is sort of like slow, you know. Yeah. Nothing is rushed. Whereas when I go to Dublin, everything is like 100 miles an hour, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I've come to appreciate that slowness, you know, where okay. I fought against it for a, okay, for a yeah. while, you know? And now I, I kind of dig it in some ways, yeah, yeah. you know? So, becoming a dry shite. I think I was, when I moved to Mama Forest, like 100% of me was still in Dublin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And over the years, the percentage is getting smaller. And now yeah, there's a part of me, there is a percentage of me now, which is a Malmo yeah. man, you know? Yeah. It's a small percentage. <laughs> but there is that percentage, and I'm starting to embrace that a bit. This you know? little piece. This is the, the this lace, is the shoelace, yeah. Swedish leg. Yeah. Um, uh, Irish hat. No. I'm starting to embrace that, you know? When the creative process is a solitary pursuit, the freedom to move on the part of the creator can be both a blessing and a curse. We left Richie behind in Malmo feeling like he'd got the balance right in this delicate world of weights and measures. But unintentionally so. Malmo seems like a happy accident as opposed to the pinnacle of a plan or a permanent pitching post. No shortage of space, plenty room to breathe, and an extremely high tolerance of inappropriate sandal wearing. The intense urban sprawl of London was another story completely. If ever there was a man to find the words to tell the tale, it was Enda Walsh. He fits right in like a native plant. The conditions seem right. He's fully transformed, yet completely unchanged. He keeps his fingers tightly on the driving wheel as other cars pass, but knows exactly where to find the carryman of a Thursday. If his greeting was a song, it'd be, what a wonderful world. And we were privileged to hum along while he played it over and over to our great delight. I used to have a paper round on, on uh, when I was like about 10 or 11 and there was a woman up our road, I better not say her name, a Kerry woman actually. And, uh, and, uh, Oh, that's surprising. <laughs> and I was uh, on the Friday, I collected the money on the Friday, and it was one of my first sort of Fridays anyway. And, um, and she turned around to me and she said, um, uh, where do you live? And I said, I just live down the road, I only live down in Foxfield Grove. And she goes, who's your mother? And uh, I said, um, uh, her name is Maeve, um, Maeve Watt. And she said, I don't, I don't know her at all, I don't know her at all. I said, who's your father? And I said, uh, it's, um, his name is Sean, and he's like, he's, he's, and what does he do? And he said, well, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a, a shop. He's got a shop in, in Northside Shopping Centre. And she goes, right, I have you. And I thought sort of like, and that is sort of like, I mean, to, to people do want to know your story in Ireland. So there's a lot of that, like, like who are you? And like, um, what are you at? And all that type of thing. And there's a lot of like, you know, but, and, but I, always, I always go back to that. The, you know, the Shannon Keith sort of thing of like a person standing up like in a hedge and sort of in, and going and have to sort of proclaim there's a lot of proclamation about you know who we are and what we are as sort of like as, as people and uh, are we all together and who are you and do, do, do you know what I mean so and, 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 you, and you begin to sort of tell what, a story what and what you bring as well you know? yes exactly he came down with this yes exactly kind of exactly like what are you at yeah, yeah. 
you know, like. <laughs> what have you got to say to yourself? Well, you know, I think it's yeah. I think it's it's that you know, like you know, make sure that you exist. <laughs> you know, and 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 I think that is like that's a great that's in the sort of DNA of every Irish person. But that is the starting point to almost every fucking dramatic sort of yeah. moment on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Make sure you actually do something. Yeah, like, who yeah. are you? What are you at? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. and keep on going. You know, and da, 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 and all that type of thing. And add in, okay, can I add in another little bit? Okay, so in Kerry, right, the, the, the general, like in deep Kerry, the general way to greet somebody is by taking the piss out of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Making a joke of them, like, yeah. going, oh, here's the man with the big car, and like, you know, no, you weren't that, you weren't so big last night, man, when I saw you down, you know, that kind of yes, thing. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Then you yeah. gotta get in, that, that's how you, that's how yeah. you, like. So you're immediately start. starting off with a story. You immediately, <laughs> put, you, you put them into scene one, and you go, like, off, yes. you, off you go, you know? Ex- 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 exactly, exactly. So, th- so they are really, you know, from from a, you know, not just, you know, it's the it's the, the job of the sort of like the dramatist to jump in and sort of examine examine those sort of you know impulses and those sort of starting points and all that type of thing, and uh, and then just expand them. And then you know, what's it like for a character who doesn't know who the hell they are and who's been asked and is trying to sort of you know battle with you know what they're at or where they're sort of and what does the world look like you know to them. You know the amount of sort of pressure on them and all that type of thing, and then and then it sort of folds into the fantastic because I think a lot of, you know, Irish stuff and Irish rural Ireland and all that type of thing is quite sort of can be quite you know hallucinogenic and strange and odd and you know hilarious and terrifying and all that. The job of the playwright or whatever, or any sort of is to try and get under the, you know, it's trying to dive into the silences and try and figure out what's under the, you know, the, you know, what's, 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 what's in the piece and then find a way of artistically showing it so that it isn't just some sort of simple sort of narrative, but like, you know, what's screaming in the sort of like silences and, you know, like underneath the nails of a sort of piece and all that type of thing. But as a boy, like, I mean, I, 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 I definitely, I mean, I suppose I've spent a, a long time um, being very sort of sensitive to atmosphere. Yeah. And uh, and trying to figure out what the story is when you know um, when nothing particularly is sort of happening, but something might happen, yeah. or something <laughs> happened yesterday, but it's still in the room. That's why I'm sort of obsessed with sort of stepping into people's houses and trying to figure out when the people aren't there. It's like I'm a burglar, but when you step into someone's sort of house yeah. and you get a sense of actually, you know, there's a lot of ghosts and a lot of sort of stories and a lot of still atmosphere there. So a lot of the job is trying to sort of take that atmosphere and then try and find some narrative around it or some collection of scenes around it so you feel as if you're telling that story. For me, all drama is about, it seems to be about identity and it seems to be about a character trying to figure out actually where they are and, um, you know, what that sort of, what the environment is for them and all that type of thing. And I, and I think as Irish people, that's our sort of default thing. You know, we've investigated our identity for like, because of, you know, you know, where we've come from and, you know, and, you know, our history. And, uh, and still even now, and that's the great sort of creative sort of impulse. It's like, I think, why Ireland and places like Iceland, you know, you know these like, these islands, need to sort of uh, stand up and figure it out and shout it out and find ways, different ways of sort of asking probably the same question, you know. So I've, I've, I've always felt as if I've just been writing the same piece for, uh, you know, 20, 20 years now, you know, of um, characters who are inarticulate, who, uh, who are outsiders, who are broken, who are sort of, you know, uh, um, and they're just trying to, they're trying to sort of, figure out who they are or what has just happened uh, in a moment of time. I think those stories and that sort of expression has always been there, but I think, but these days, I mean, in the last sort of, you know, 15 odd years, there's a lot of people, you know, just because of the way the world is going, there's a lot of people making work, yeah. making, sort of expressing themselves, being able to express themselves yeah. in art and photography and sort of, you know, in writing and whatever, in film and all that type of thing. It's easier to do that. So actually, so there is a huge amount of work yeah. now. I mean, those stories have always been there. And I can, you can draw a line back, you know, centuries to the t- same type of sort of stories. Yeah. 
there does feel like some like you know there there are a lot of people doing things, making yeah. stuff, and you know like a, um, being able to do it, and uh, the fact that they want to do it. You know that we live in a country whereby you know I'm not going to sort of shit on any other country, but there might be some other a couple of other sort of European sort of countries who don't feel that sort of that need to actually make stuff. Yeah. I mean, people are shocked when they come to Ireland. They go, "Fuck, there's so much fucking music, yeah. and you've created all these fucking writers and da da da, and you know, like, and all of this stuff." You know, it's you could say, well, it's, it's largely sort of a rural place, and I think sort of rural people are really fucking interesting. Oh yeah. And you know, like, and they're you know parish-based communities, and they're real, you know, individualistic. You know, like, and they live in a very sort of small environment themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a there's a, there's an energy and sort of an eccentricity sometimes yeah. to those characters that's really hilarious and just yeah. like wild and, yeah. and all that. But I've always thought, like, culturally, like how British people look at Irish work from a sort of theatre point of view or whatever, how they sort of see it. They, I think they, they, do, they do look at a lot of our work with either, you know, oh, they, they, you know, that Irish people sort of have this sad melancholy about them and it's sort of like, and it's, it's a loss and all this sort of thing, or else, or else the theatre tends to be just a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. right. And we don't think it's, we don't particularly sort of think it's weird, but they'd be a little bit, you know, it's a bit frightened by it, and a bit like, I really just don't get it. No, I'm not just talking about my work. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about sort of like contemporaries of yeah. mine who sort of work over here, or even sort of like a generation younger than me, yeah. you know, or they would find like Beckett really, really, really hard, while we go, actually, it's not that hard. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of, it's really not, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's... It's where people go, it's what happens, it's the truth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There are some people who simply should not be introduced without at least a cursory glance at their list of achievements. Fiona Shaw is one of these. She has twice won the Olivier Award for Best Actress, collected a CPE, and has produced groundbreaking work in collaboration with Deborah Warner. She directs drama and opera. She has pursued the higher ground since leaving Ireland in the late 1970s. Like all her brethren, she remains a staunch Carconian. You know, you don't know what career you're going to have. You, you think one thing and then it becomes something else. It's all a journey. So I don't know. I just knew that I should be trained. Actually, I don't think I saw beyond that. You know, it's George Bernard Shaw saying, you know, it doesn't matter. He lived in England until he was 92 or whenever he died. And he said, I have lived in this country for 70 years, but it doesn't matter. It's the first 20 that matter. Yeah. I think that is so true mm -hmm. that everything comes from your childhood. Everything. I, I, you, you think it doesn't. You know, I've lived much more of my life in London or based in London than mm -hmm. in Cork. But... It's those first 20 years that tell you everything when you, all the eccentricities of my childhood, all the people who came to the house who were part of my parents' life, they're all the, they are the gold mine, they are the bomb that explodes yeah. your imagination. The way of working at the time was terribly um, obsessive in that we, at the Royal Shakespeare Company, we would be rehearsing maybe two plays and be performing another play and then you might be performing two plays and rehearsing a third play so you're rehearsing all day and performing all night and, and you might be performing finally three plays as I was in that first season three plays in the week so you're pretty well on you were performing one play on a Saturday afternoon another play in the evening it was fantastic practice mm -hmm. and of course you're also going through quite a big repertoire of plays yeah. and the preoccupations of those plays began to really excite me, the, the scale of them, the scale of playing Celia and As You Like It, of going to the Forest of Arden, of going to a place where you break out of one system and go into a, a freer place where you discover who you are. Well, I now see, 30 years later, that's probably exactly what I was doing. The eccentricity of people, the delightful... I think it's also very good about being brought up somewhere slightly small because you meet everyone when, you, when the smaller the world. I meet nobody in London because I'm either at home or I'm at work, but yes. when you're in a small town, you meet absolutely everybody. You bump into everybody. You bump into everybody and uh, my father was an eye surgeon and he knew everybody. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my mother was very social and she knew absolutely everybody. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you couldn't go down the street without bumping into so-and-so. Of course, then you get the whole story, so-and-so, because that person was married to so-and-so, of course. Then. So there was always a story attached to everybody. So I, I, I think a lot of English people didn't have that. Yeah. I, it's not just that I was an outsider, but that the richness of being brought up in Ireland. Sure. Um, and Cork in particular. And Cork in particular. <laughs> no, maybe Dublin's well, just as big. I mean, Kerry, well, I'm Spain, sure the same. No, no, I would say Tralee is... has it, or Galway has it. I, 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 I think we're a very social country anyway, and people are very celebratory of each other. Exactly. I mean, you know, people get overexcited seeing somebody they saw yesterday. They go, hello, you know, <laughs> as if it's just amazing that you're seeing each other again. <gasps> what are you doing here? <laughs> well, because there's about two streets and we're bound to be in one or other of them. I mean, it's amazing how people go, it's amazing to see you, we haven't seen you for ages. That means a week, you know. Um, so I, I think that there's a real privilege in being brought up Irish. Irish. I, I, I do feel that. I had at school, I had always been the big mimic in yeah. the class. In fact, it's something I can't do at all now. Okay. Yeah, I got far too empathetic to people, but yeah. I was a big mimic. I used to mimic the teachers, and so, so I was the clown. Yeah. yeah, and I was a clown at school, and yeah. I played the, you know, the judge in trial by jury. And, I mean, uh, uh, all of that was it's so obvious in hindsight that that was just a, a, a way out of a sort of energy explosion. But yeah. So I really didn't settle down into what acting really might be until I was about 29. Okay. And that's where the lecture was at that yeah. point, right? Yeah, and then subsequently I played Hedda Gabler, which, which I wanted to go back to Ireland. I, I'd been spending the whole decade wanting to go to Ireland, yeah. and uh, kindly Gary Hines invited me to come and play Hedda Gabler at the Abbey. So it was a fantastic chance to uh, leave this other culture that I'd been playing within and apply things I knew about Ireland to Hedda Gabler mm -hmm. and to work with Irish actors, of course. I was able to really feel the history of the country in it. I, I, I really enjoyed that. The work with Deborah was so good because we had plenty of time. We would stop the rehearsal and go to lunch and then talk about it. I mean, you know, maybe it's obsessional, but you chat about it. And then in the chatting, something drifts up into your mind. I remember when we were doing Hedda Gabler and we didn't, there's a terrible stage direction about Hedda throwing the, um, she throws Eilid Lovborg's manuscript into the fire. There was nothing about the way we were doing it would make you throw something in the fire. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh no she, no, she peels it bit by bit and she puts it, you know, self-consciously bit by bit. There was nothing about my performance that was peeling. So we threw it in the fire and tried to get it out. It was much more interesting, but okay. that, that came out of kind of having a coffee in Dublin, thinking, yeah. surely I should do what I would do. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly find yourself breaking a rule when in fact you're just serving the, the, the form. As it happens, just after that, Hedda Gabler experience, I, I did feel that what I had been trained in was lacking in Ireland, that we didn't have that kind of training. And I talked to Gary about it, that there was, you know, that the repertoire in Ireland was very Irish. And of course, there's a really good reason for that, that we need to tell ourselves stories about ourselves. But mm -hmm. the problem with telling yourself a story about yourself is that the story can only stay in the group yeah. to, who, who, to whom it's being targeted, mm -hmm. who's being targeted. So we were never really applying ourselves to the wider issues of what it was like to be a Russian or <laughs> what it was like to be um, Hamlet. Or we, we were, so I had performed Electra with the wonderful John Lynch. And so I was asked to direct a Hamlet uh, as a project. We called it the Hamlet Project. So it wasn't, you know, going to be tied up into some production. We had a very small budget and we were to take it to small places around Ireland. And that was, I mean, a directorial debut really, but it was really not even a debut. It was a collaboration, or that's what I felt it was. And um, we changed the design in every place we went to. We responded to this building we were put in, uh, which actually was fantastic for me because after we did that show, I subsequently went to Germany and I, I learned T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And I sort of shared with Deborah Warner this excitement of using spaces that were not theatrical. Mm -hmm. And we then performed The Wasteland in spaces that were not theatrical. And that went around the world. 
and each city, the poems seem to take on the, the feeling of the city. I mean, I'm, I'm not making that up. Somehow, when I was in New York and you're talking about the Thames flowing, you could see the Hudson. I mean, you, it, it's a very, very visual kind of movie of a, of a poem. And that was a revelation for me. So uh, that happened. Around that time, I, I then did Richard II in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish I had taken that to Dublin. I mean, I wish yeah. we had been able to. Any act of creation is about going wrong a lot. Yeah. And in fact, you were asking me about directing. I, I think one of the most difficult things about directing is getting the group of people who are making the piece together to be together. And something about the speed of life now, due to the iPhone, due to us thinking we can do more than we can, means that you never spend a session wasting time, when in fact it's very important to waste time. What's become, I've noticed in the last four years, really difficult is that in every session, you're only meeting four times more before you have to hand in the final design. And it's not really how creation, creation is time. The nature of the pathway changes with other newer forms. With music, playwriting and acting, we have dined at the top table for some time now. But other art forms like filmmaking, design and visual arts were late starters. Filmmakers with the far-seeing eye of Ethan McCardle are making up for lost time on our behalf. In essence, it's not just about visuals that we wanted to talk to her about, but something more like a vision that she has fashioned all of her own. Like, I think every single Every single kind of art form, like you say, like opera, dance, you know, there, or even just going into a pub and seeing old characters chatting to each other, like I feel like your inferences come from everywhere, really, you know, like you can find like the beauty in art in so many things and, and you know, in, in very ordinary things like that too, as well as like high art, like opera. And I think it's important to be influenced by all of it, you know, to absorb all of it and, and almost on an equal level like I find like the best characters are these kind of old dudes who've been sitting in pubs for years or on street corners or you know and the best actors are on hanging out in street corners smoking fags and have never been to <laughs> anywhere near a, a, um, a drama school you know and I, I find that really exciting too and I think like it's important that you you know you're influenced by your everyday life as well and the characters that are in it too I think. I find myself gravitating towards any stories that are about outsiders or um, about, you know, people who want to escape or, um, you know, sort of quite existential stories where it's this person sort of versus the, the universe. That video is, um, it's one of those times where you just have a light bulb moment, which doesn't happen that often, you know, like where it comes to you in one go, the way that that video did. And I think it was because I loved the music so much, I sort of like find the track so visually inspiring that when I was listening to it, I saw, you know, the film in my head as soon as I heard it. And, you know, that's always something that you want to happen. It doesn't always happen instantly like that. Um, and it depends on how, how I'm into the music you are, I think. And I just find it such a, um, you know, such a beautifully hypnotic and, um, but also quite emotive track that the story of like a kid trying to escape in the only way they knew how to was, you know, came into my mind and then just the rhythm of the music and the, you know, the mesmerising quality of it. I kept thinking of the skateboarding and how the rhythm of that, you know, if it was elegant enough and beautiful enough to watch would match, you know, the music perfectly. And essentially I wanted it to be all about the journey rather than the destination. So it was sort of like quite an existential idea, which I felt the track was already. So it sort of was like, you know, it just sort of was a, yeah, a marriage of... When you hear the music, it's your sound... You know, for me, the music is the soundtrack. What is the film that will go with that soundtrack? And then, you know, that was one of my favourite things I've had the opportunity to work on.
Because I've done quite epic um, commercials, I suppose you would say. I mean, they're always narrative short films that I make. But, you know, I've had an opportunity through those to work with huge crews, you know, much, much bigger than I had on my feature. So, in a way, like, um, yeah, just, you know, I've had a lot of practice with communicating ideas and gathering the team around you that you want to work with, you know, and it's hugely important. You're like a family and you need to all be on the same page and you need to all be in it together. And, you know, so um, I suppose what's different about a feature is, you know, it's such a long haul that, like, you know, you just need to make sure that you're all really on the same page more and more and keep communicating all the time and really try and paint your vision for people. But, I mean, a big part of painting your vision for me is just, like, storyboarding really rigorously and, you know, trying to be as detailed as possible in my descriptions. And, you know, the way I wrote the script, I kind of wrote it more like a novel um, because I was so invested in the visual side of it that, like, I would paint the picture visually, you know, I'd write down every detail in the frame, which is probably not the most conventional way to write a script, but I think if you're a writer-director, that's... You can't help doing that possibly because you're, you know, you're trying to paint the image for everyone. But the beauty of that is that then when you're, you know, you're with your crew, you know, they have a very detailed description of what you want from the outside, which I think helps everyone, you know, because the key to making films work is just, you know, having the highest level of communication you can amongst you all, and so you can all operate as a team and taking your interests and skills to those things but I think as well it's just like if you really genuinely are curious about human beings and you know uh, I think finding ordinary people extremely interesting is really important you know because that means that's going to drive your storytelling always um, you know and I, I find that like Oh, there's so many amazing stories to tell. Like, I'm always thinking, there's so many in Belfast, you know, how would you ever get through them? You know, like, and that's exciting to me as well. Like, um, it's trying to sort of, like, unify. For me, it's funny. It's trying to unify, like, this a mad interest in human beings and the ordinary with this sort of, like, quite melodramatic <laughs> vision of the world that sort of comes out visually. It's sort of, like, it's interesting. It's sort of, like, I'm trying to, like work out ways to unify those things. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Art at its simplest is easy to understand and admire or vilify. The criticism of art, however, has acquired for itself a reputation for density and for the use of highfalutin language. The will to live on the part of the art fan has been known to dissipate on opening a page of an art catalogue. So when an artist comes along with equal parts talking the talk and walking the walk in their arsenal, it's time to sit up straight and take notice. While in New York earlier this year, unbidden and entirely by beautiful accident, we stumbled upon a show by Ava Rothschild which blew out our windows and doors. It was sculpture, but at another level entirely. Finding out she was Irish rendered me speechless. I barely recovered in time to get the questions out for our studio visit. I didn't have to say much. I arrived as an admirer of the form, but left feeling I understood it. The thing about being a sculptor, which I definitely would say now that I'm a sculptor yeah. and kind of I feel quite passionate about that and quite kind of almost sort of political about it. I think that that took a really long time to come for me because I think I felt such a kind of like, a, and I still feel it, I just actually do it now though, an anxiety about making and a sense that like, you know, how would you do that? Like, how could that be there, you know? And and also the sculpture, you know, it's it sort of, it's always, in the room, it's never, you know, set back. It's always very present. And I think, you know, it did take me a long time. I think a lot of the work sort of that I was seeing was very kind of conceptual. And I mean, obviously there is the conceptual in all artwork. You can't have work without thought. But like, I think to sort of commit to the, the sort of sculptural, a sculptural practice that actually really came quite sort of late. It sort of, you know, it felt quite tentative um, and then suddenly it became everything. 
some things that are that's overriding in all the work is I'm really interested in creating a kind of almost a sort of confusion about what you're looking at. So you you see the shape, but yeah, the colors perhaps are doing something with that that makes you sort of mistrust perhaps mm -hmm. sort of what's going on in front of you. Or so you that your yeah, the so actually. there's a sense that like you know. The, the, the black seems to define something quite solidly, but perhaps the red sort of seems to be slightly going in another direction. So you're asking a question then, well, where, where does this end and begin? And that sense of a kind of material confusion and sort of how that makes the eye react to the work and then become engaged in a sort of more intense way of looking is for me the kind of primary sort of site of, of sort of communication, I guess, between the audience and the, and the artwork. I have my own set of kind of parameters around the work that I am interested in. But I do feel that the work shouldn't be defined by a specific narrative or anything or sort of a specific agenda. It should be about the apprehension of the work and the sort of, rather than perhaps meaning the sort of presence of the work and the presence of the body and the eye in relation to the object. The studio is the, is for me, the most important thing in terms of the making, but then that moment where there's the cutoff and the work goes out, it's like, and you have to leave it, you know, and, you know, I think that if you didn't have to do that, it just, you know, it would be ongoing. It's like, because you can always change it. The making begets the making, okay. you know, I mean, I think very much so. I mean, I often feel very anxious about sort of, well, about stuff generally, but I find that the sort of the best way to move forwards is to be involved in making. So if you have to make a decision, and that decision is, you know, creative or uh, inspirational occasionally, or, you know, pragmatic or whatever. But then in terms of the thing being made, it's often a sort of job of work. Like, you know, you've cast the objects, and they need to all have all the seams taken off them. You know, that is sitting down and just doing that. And that is kind of, it's both work and it's where the other work kind of happens. A lot of the time there's things that don't work out now, but then, you know, two years' time, it that could thing be right. could come round mm -hmm. to the centre. Sometimes you have to kind of go down some kind of blind alley to get back to where you yeah. where you wanted to be. But then it's strange, sometimes you have peace and you just have a real emotional resonance with it, and mm -hmm. you're just like, I don't know what it is, but it's the thing that I wanted, you know? Yeah. And I suppose that's the... That's where the kind of art is. I guess that's where that lies yeah. sometimes. More than ever now, when everything is about sort of the screen or the sort of mediated experience or, you know, the sort of the, the surface as well, you know, the, I think that sculpture has a sort of interesting role to play in terms of being something that is, you have to be in the presence of, you know. If you see a photograph of it, it is just a photograph. It is not the same as the, yeah. the thing. Your, your contentment, where, where is your greatest sort of like, where does that lie? When I'm asleep. Huh? When I'm asleep. <laughs> I'm not a very contented okay. person. You know, I do think of myself as an Irish artist and in any situation where that's kind of named, you know, I will always be that I'm an Irish artist. It's like you, you are the sum of your experiences and my experience is that I grew up in Ireland and that I am Irish and so that does feed into the work and I think it's sometimes hard to pinpoint, but I guess if only I can make this work at this moment in time, well then it has to have sort of come through that experience. Yeah. Being allowed inside the studio to get so close to the art of the matter is a rare privilege. Much like the work that comes from them, these are personal spaces. On a free day in Brooklyn, I looked up a man called Brian Ormond, as I knew he had a studio in the area. I had known him in a previous life, holding projects like Radiohead's World Tour together. The news that he had struck out on his own was intriguing and worth a visit alone. This particular pathway was thus far a singular one, unencumbered by any outside influence whatsoever. The guys I was working for, they, they, they could see that I was starting to dabble in boat, in boat fields and they went, you know, they encouraged me and kind of pushed me to go and, and explore that 
uh, it was my wife, Melissa, who, who suggested, would I try sculpt, doing sculpting? And I laughed at her because I had no experience in the art world, no experience in being creative in any way. And, and she said, no, try it. And I, I laughed, I really did laugh. Because I was immersed in that organizing, that punctuality, whether it's a flight or a hotel or a stage time or whatever. Um, but once that, once the door like just became opened a little bit, and and I saw that I didn't have to, I could just chill out and relax, which I'd probably never done before. I never had sat down and looked at things. Once that opened, it just the floodgates was in, it was it was amazing. And I went to a place called the Art Student League, which is. Uh, the old, they say the oldest art school in the US. And I went there for a year and a half, two years, and, and it was where Rotko went, and Rosenberg, Georgia O'Keeffe. And when you're in there, you're not taught art, but you're immersed in, a, in studios where everyone's doing whatever they want to do, um, whether it's watercolor or abstract or oils or figurative or whatever. I went to the abstract and for me, I said, oh wow, I can do I can do what I want. It's a tough city mm -hmm. for art, but there's so much art there. Yeah, people say there's not there's some art that's not good, but there's plenty of great art. Mm -hmm. Moving out to Brooklyn, moving my studio to Brooklyn from Manhattan has opened up this mm -hmm. whole thing about bringing the street into the studio. Mm -hmm. um, it's not recycling, it's in a way to reusing, but it's about, same as me, giving things a second chance in life or a third chance. So I had one career or one direction in life, mm -hmm. now I have another. Um, so the, the pieces are about looking at things in a different way or looking at them in a fresher or second way, mm -hmm. a new way. When I started, everything I made was sacred and special and mm -hmm. you know, the people call them your child and all that. Yeah. I mean, that is so out the door now. Yeah. Yeah. So out the door, I, I can... You know, I could I could get a painting and just paint black all over it and start again. Okay. You know, I could okay. do that. It's not a problem. Like while they might be obtuse in some way, they're not deliberately so. It, no, it has no. great meaning to you. Yeah, yeah. But like, but, but that thing about saying I am an artist was that okay? Was that okay for you? It took a while, but now I don't think I could go through a day or a week without making art yeah. in some form or another. Yeah. So now. I know I'm clearly end up, end up, end up, yeah, end up Believe thing. Like, you know, a while ago when I was explaining, when I was saying to you, I find it very hard to multitask. I, that was never a problem before. I could do, I thought, five or ten things at a time and do them all pretty well. Certainly do two of them well. Yeah. Now I, I can only do one, I really only can do one thing. And I find myself saying it, um, I can't multitask. And it's something I become a little bit proud of as well. Okay. I don't use it as an excuse. Yeah. Just let me do this, yeah. and then I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's like the art. I I like to work on one piece. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be finished, but I leave that and then go and do something else, and then come back to it. And I also love that. That's a different thing. Coming back and looking at a different yeah. light, a different mood, a different day, yeah. a different atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I've done something else before. Yeah. And now. This, this one, this baby, is going to be for what I think is going to be for the rest of it. Yeah. I do have goals. I do a place yeah. I want to get to and stuff. And mm -hmm. and once I keep them in check, and it's important for me to do that, then because they they affect making the art, being creative. Mm -hmm. um, once once they're put in check, then I really don't mind how mm -hmm. long it takes, and and where it goes and how I get there. Our meeting point with Rich Gilligan was never going to be his studio. The skate park is more his domain. The quality of his photographs is such that new pictures drop like records. An event in itself. Something to dive into. And to give time to. The fact that he also wrote the book on how to keep it real was unknown to me. Humility he wore like a purple heart. I remember like borrowing or like my dad's camera at this little point and shoot Olympus when I was probably 12, 13 and then I remember like trying to take skate photos with that and, and Wait, the, on the board or like just of like I would just bring the camera with me with friends and like take pictures of us just dicking around yeah. and just being like I don't know just thinking like oh this is interesting this is I could try and take a picture like that photo in that magazine of but like obviously we were a terrible 
we're really bad skateboarders. We're like oh, I'm looking at all these magazines where it's like a photograph of like the Brooklyn Banks in New York with some pro doing some amazing trick, and I'm like down outside the credit union in Blanchardstown going, yeah, so how do I make this look like this? If anything, my camera felt like this, like, I don't know, like, like a cloak I could put over myself, or all of a sudden I had this thing and I felt like I was invisible, or all of a sudden I had a reason to be interested in something. And, and at that stage, I wasn't thinking about, like, being a photographer. I just wanted to be, like, a skateboard photographer because I might get to go and shoot pictures in some interesting places with interesting people who I'm, like, influenced by. And maybe this is, like, a little route into that. I was very selective about what I shot. So it was nearly like I was editing as I shot, but just out of necessity because I couldn't afford to be, you know, 36 frames, that's like, that was it. Yeah. You know, you kind of, you have to make them count. I was lucky that early on, I, like I knew I was into it. So I knew like the whole time through school, I was just like, yeah, I'm going to be a photographer. And like I knew that, honestly, like I knew that from when I was 16. And I, re I only realize now how I'm really lucky. Knowing that I loved photography and, and the act of it, when I got to Sally Noggin and like learning about a how a darkroom works and like this, the magical process of like creating a print and like putting a negative into an enlarger and that light going onto this exposed onto paper and then the magic of like, the put, like putting that image into that chemistry for the first time and seeing like, this image appear and I really like genuinely like really affected me and I just had this moment where I'm just like hairs in the back of my neck just being like this is magic like this is so magic and I really was just so excited by it that like I just couldn't believe like firstly that I discovered this thing that I was I wasn't great like I wasn't good yet like I was still figuring it out but also that like I was no longer in school where I had to like try and learn about all these things I didn't really give a shit about all I had to do was like Take, like, take photos, process film, and make prints. And that was all I had to do. And I was like the first person, like I probably was the furthest commute from like Blanchestown to Sally Noggin. I would get the Ross Lair train. And I was the first person there every day and I was the last person to leave every day. I just couldn't, but I was just like, this is like, this is, I've hit the jackpot. For me, I'm interested in the process. Okay. I just enjoy the feeling of like, you know, the shutter release and, and like, this moment in time where it's like and it's like you've captured something the amount of amazing people I've met just because I have a camera and like places I've been sent just because I have a camera and I oh it gives me like the perfect excuse to be like a real nosy fucker and really curious in the world because the way I approach it whether I'm shooting some fashion job for a brand or whether it's like some famous actor or actress or I don't know, it's treat every, it's all, it's treated all the same. Portraiture is a huge part of my practice and I, and I love it. And I just love meeting people, interacting with people and just trying to like get to that point where there's a level of trust there where I feel I walk away with a portrait that really reflects that person. And like, th this is a whole argument about like photographic truth. Like photography is not about truth. Like photography is all smoke and mirrors. And you know, it's a version of your truth of what you're trying to present. I love how grounded we are as, like, as a people without totally generalizing. And I love that, you know, you don't get away with any shit. Like you'll be knocked down straight away. And that's, I love that. But at the same time, like, you know, it's delicate and you don't, there's probably so many people who are, you know, capable of really amazing things that for whatever reasons, culturally because they're kind of trapped in this mindset they don't follow things through or they feel that sure what's the point in doing that sure what would I do sure I, I couldn't do that and I think that that's where it's that kind of negative side of it I think can be really trapping and it can really affect people not in a good way yeah. but then equally it's kind of part of what makes us so amazing as well yeah. is this ability to like not take ourselves too serious our way, you know? and like we punch above our weight with, yeah. e with everything it's not just I don't just mean that as like creatives or artists. Yeah. It's like in every shape or form. Like we're a tiny island on the edge of Europe and look at the impact we have. I think one thing you learn from being Irish and putting yourself like in a situation totally out of your comfort zone is like you surprise yourself at how resourceful you can be. And I think that's something we're really good at.
I'm not like out to prove anything. I'm just still really like really into photography yeah. and, and the fact that like and I think there's something still just about the still image and I, fi I find like there's an intimacy to it you can't find it anywhere else I, I think it's still important yeah. and it's all about trying to like show people you know a part of the world that maybe they don't normally see on every like and whether that's like a bunch of lads at Valley Farmer who keep horses in the back garden or it's a bunch of skateboarders in Portland, Oregon, who've built a skate park, or whether it's just like landscapes and places that I'm drawn, like I'm, I'm just drawn to like these kind of places we don't usually see. Those questions you had in your head when you were sort of 15 or 16, and then, yeah. you know, later on, if you, if you maintain that line, I mean, I always wanted to be a DJ and I, I became a DJ, and like, I, I feel that like, that is, like I said, that one solid connection to person that yeah. I knew because I, I was exactly the same as you described yeah, there just pass a record shop can't do it you know like I know. know no and it's that kind of obsession and like when you're just when you're that into something yeah. you can't help obsession. but like you can't help but like be like that yeah. and I don't think you should make any apologies for it and it's ultimately yeah. what makes you kind of just shapes you into the person you are and like I kind of have to stop sometimes and just be like you kind of have to stop yourself and just realise how grateful you should be yeah. that, like, you get to do this. Yeah. And that, but, like, that also, I've kind of, like, manifested this through some weird, like, yeah. lots of the magazines and lots of the people I've been lucky enough to work with. Like, I've, for years, I, like, sat on a bus travelling in and out of Blanchestown in Dublin, like, yeah. like, looking at these magazines and looking at these, yeah. like, and just being like, oh, that'd be amazing to do that. And, like planting those seeds where you're like oh this would be amazing imagine living in New York imagine doing this and like and then like you don't realise it but like you're you're kind of like building these things really slowly and then and not and I don't think that ever ends it's not like you, you reach this point where you're like yeah. that's it like I'm sorted now because probably when you reach that point and you do think like that you're kind of fucked I feel really lucky yeah. but I also feel like you make your own look as well yeah, yeah. and I don't want to be trying to paint this picture that it's all just like shh yeah, yeah. Like there are serious like yeah. <laughs> there's high highs and low lows. Failure is like it's hugely important and it's such it's a part of it. Part of it yeah. You know, and you have to like being able to let go of that ego and just be like this like this may work. I hope it will work. And you, but usually when you feel it in your gut and it's genuine, it kind of will work out. Like the universe is this weird way of helping you along the way. I don't know. Sometimes you feel you could do it a lot more. While it thrives as an unapologetic homage to commerce in a deeply unequal city, New York still gives ample room for those who like to dream big to set out their stall. It invites you to make it there, and then buys you a bus ticket to make it anywhere. So it does. Word on Broadway reached us that a first-generation Kerry man, whose debut dance steps had been traditional Irish ones, had become head of the Tisch School of Contemporary Dance at NYU. This was one pathway we simply had to take a closer look at. Our host was some guy. The story is that my Aunt Sally, who paid my mother's way over, yeah, in the late 1950s, was grocery shopping with my mom, and I was running up and down the aisles of the supermarket and I think responding to the music that was playing, and Aunt Sally said, you should put him in Irish step dancing classes, knock some of the taspy out of him. <laughs> and um, so the, there was a great lady named Josephine Moran, and she taught Irish step dancing at the local VFW, sort of union hall place. I think it was a dollar a lesson, an hour on a Saturday morning. And I remember the first jig step I learned, and I was good at it and loved it and got a lot of attention, and uh, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the... Irish American step dancer story as mine, feshes and set pieces and Kayleys and you know, dancing at weddings and St. Patrick's Day parties. And then you go into the this notion that the dance studio, the theater, is church, is temple, is mosque, is hallowed ground. Um, art makes sense out of a chaotic universe where bad things happen to good people. I think in the same way religion does. Yeah. So I love this idea, to dance is to pray. Yeah. yeah, well, I got a lot of great positive attention, and when we danced at, at 
weddings or Kaylee's, we got paid, so that was good. <clears throat> my mom made me a kilt, right? Yeah. Um, she had a, my sister had a little sort of a skating dress with Irish champ rocks or Celtic uh, knotwork embroidered on it. Um, and I love the theatricality of it. I love showing off. Um, and then when I got to high school and I started to perform in the musicals, uh, I was good at it. I was already a performer. And in fact, I had a great English teacher who directed the musicals in high school. And she said, I want you to choreograph the next show. I didn't even know what the word choreograph meant. But she said, you'll make up the dances. And I like being in charge. It was reels and jig steps. She didn't care. It didn't matter. Um, and, and I liked it. So. The seed was planted pretty early that I might be a, a choreographer. I knew I wanted to perform first. I was a real show off, a big ham. But uh, someday I was gonna be the guy telling people what to do. Now I don't perform so much anymore, I'm 56. But when I was six or seven, that adrenaline rush, yeah. that like stage fright, mm -hmm. um, that feeling of euphoria when you finish and you bow and people are clapping, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's uh, incredible, there's nothing like it. Uh, you know, I teach quite a bit, I, I run the dance department at New York University, and I say to my students, when is your life in flow? When is it working? For some people it's when they're cooking, or parenting, or making love, or I don't know, yeah? Painting a picture. For me it has always been when I'm moving to interesting or beautiful music. And for the first, you know, 15 years of my dance life, that was to Irish music. And um, it, it, it's how I connect to joy. in contemporary dance is that as a choreographer, we, we make what's called abstract work, right? Uh, not imitating scenes from life, not necessarily telling a story. Maybe there's an implied narrative in there, but uh, it's when I'm a teacher and I can use humor in the, in the classroom, or when I have to speak at a, a post-performance discussion. That's when my Irish storyteller soul comes out. Now, I will tell you that the great ballet choreographer George Balanchine said some wonderful things, but one thing I love that he said, he said, you put a man and a woman on stage, you got a story. Yeah. Add another man, you've got plot. I think we Irish are kind of a social yeah. people. Um, a lot of my work has looked at where do I end and we begin, yeah. right? How do we overlap? And it's through storytelling, I think, we, we figure that out. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, being the son of Irish immigrants, they had to bring their stories with them. You know, there was always this idea of home. You say home. When I was a kid, my sisters and I worried that if our parents died, could we bury them in America, right? Do we have to bury you in Ireland? They, and they said, no, no, you can bury us here. But home was such an important thing. And the music, the language, uh, I, you know, Naharagas and Vic Agan Spirit and Evan Men. We did it every night at, yeah, at the, yeah. the table. It was important to my dad. It was important yeah. to my mom. So there's a story right there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And we'd ask my mother, tell us the story about Master Durr, who yeah. was like her school teacher. Uh, or, you know, we'd t ask my father, tell us the story again about the time, you know, you got chased or whatever it was. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a connection to a place, an idea, a different time. It's sad now because I would love to take my mother home to Ireland and she won't go because it's changed so much. It's not the Ireland she knows and remembers. Okay, right. I'm fortunate. I never say I'm going to work. I say I'm going to rehearsal, I'm going to teach a class, yeah. I'm going to see a performance. Um, I don't go to work. You know, I get to do what I love. And there's a lot of Walking Dead out here in New York yeah. City, you know, going to their job and working. And I'm never going to be that guy. So I count my blessings every day and, and realize that I'm fortunate to get to do what I want and what, what I get to do, what I love. I have my dark nights of the soul, to be sure. Yeah. But that's where the art comes from. That's, that's this melancholy we talked about. That's where the, the poetics lie. So, the High Cross, the Holy Cross, Brian before the B+. Plus. The man we had come furthest to meet. 
When thinking up the idea of pathways, it was his story that set the template. Here was a man with high ideals and a heart of Limerick gold who didn't just get close to the fire of the LA music scene, he practically started it, stoked it and set it ablaze. His photographic thesis for Cal Arts became a definitive book about West Coast hip hop. These days he is a fellow at San Diego University while continuing to curate, inculcate and activate a music scene which has provided him with a career that stretches the boundaries of the believable in all directions. The first two days of our encounter were cancelled as he had to join Damien Marley on a cruise around Jamaica with every living reggae great performing all night long. The department of Couldn't Care Less was closed for lunch. We made no complaints. I mean, this is a question that I get asked all the time, which is that, like, you know, how the fuck does somebody from such a fucking faraway place and such a, you know, who's so new to a country come and find your way into a culture and then become so embroiled in it? And it's, you know, it's the same thing that people ask, you know, like Radigan, you know, people like this. And the thing is, we actually have a, a much bigger capacity to transcend those kinds of differences than you would imagine. The formational, the foundational notions of what art, the possibilities of what art could be came from my time at NCID. I was in a group called Blue Funk. We had a reading group. We read Marx, we read Freud. We were very serious. That's still, all that stuff is still with me. And my whole notion about critique, living critique kind of, um, came from there. For as much time as I spent at NCAD, I felt like I was ready for more, you know what I mean? Like I, was, I had a capacity to take more in. I tell the kids now is like, you know, find somebody that compels you, that moves you to your core, and then go see what they're doing. Go study under them. You know, not in a kind of old school apprentice way, but in a, you know, go attend their lectures and see how their life is and understand what they're doing and understand what brought them to their, to be able to create the thing that moved you. Long story short, I go to CalArts, do the first year, spend the whole first year trying to make photographs in the San Fernando Valley around landscape. Actually a series of photographs that I really like, and a series of photographs that I still show, and a, and a series of photographs actually that, when it came to me getting the job in the UC system, mm -hmm. for all the sort of hip hop skeptics, yeah. which you can imagine there's plenty older than me that are like, they saw these photos and they were like, okay. Um, and it actually ended up getting me the big scholarship at CalArts. I was like an advocate long before I was uh, taking photographs. I was an advocate. I was like, yeah, do you know all the stuff you're talking about politics? Have you listened to NWA? I mean, you think John Coltrane is protest music? Have you listened to NWA, dude? Yeah, I was that guy. I got a lot of shit at CalArts for it. But I kind of didn't give a fuck. And very quickly I realized that the game for me was less about, um, you know, photographing the big stars and it was much more about finding people that were just as good that nobody was paying attention to. I don't know, like the thing with photography is, is that like in the end it's like a microsecond that stands for the entire exchange. The disappointing thing somehow often is that there could never be a microsecond that would stand for an entire exchange. But the kind of beautiful thing about it is, is that sometimes there's, that happens, you know, that you, that, that you're able to somehow capture something that like actually becomes emblematic of something, you know. Like, I could never have imagined what the impact would have been of playing Dilla's music with an orchestra until I heard the orchestra and, and people broke, started weeping openly. 
Like, I couldn't, like, yeah, and then we're all going to cry. No. I mean, I didn't imagine that was what was going to happen. I was just concerned about, like, how do we find a glockenspiel and what the fuck, how much money are we losing? And, uh... And then, you know, and to see his mom, you know, and her reaction. And I remember she came here the day after the show and she was like, you know, I was going to go visit his grave. His grave is very close to here. I was going to go visit his grave, but I feel like I don't need to today because I know he's good. I'm still... You know what I'm saying? Like, that's... Yeah, that's some shit. I'm, I've never been... Uh, a great fucking Gail Gordy or anything like that in my life. I was never that guy. But I would say I'm definitely never been anything less or more than Irish either, you know? Like, I've always felt very strongly connected to that shit, so... Yeah, there's something about that part of the island. Those kinds of experiences and being connected to, like, a different version of society, a different version, like, yeah, I think that's, that's it's very true. come, you know, but if you really love something, you know, then you can be fucking really good, you know. The problem I think with people these days is that they're, they get stimulated by a lot of things, but I don't know if they actually really have a deep, a grah, you know, like a proper, uh, fucking man, I couldn't, Octavia Butler says, do it because you can't imagine yourself not doing it. You know what I mean? Like, it's so... I have to. I have to go after those records. I'm not sure what sense that makes right now, but I, I need to find them. You know, I'm not sure what sense it makes for me to be photographing these dudes, but I gotta do it. And then eventually, it, all the bits open up and, you know, like you realize, oh wow, this actually is a path. Judging from the people we've met, I think it's fair to say that art is in all of us. It's how you work on those ideas and then put them into action. That's the tricky bit. Taste is another wayward pathway we could easily get a team of cartographers to attempt to map, but it's nigh on impossible. Triggers in our early life would seem to be the most traceable thread to what we like. I discovered my love of art in December 1974 when the Christmas tree was moved to the hallway thereby rendering every dark and ominous shadow a technicolor dream. The fleeting change in the color of my bedroom was the first time I noticed that the world could be altered to render it more beautiful. For 12 days only, the shadows were eclipsed by the glow of the spectrum. That feeling is the one I'm chasing in pursuit of art of any kind to find and to love. The tree of life smells of pine. As wayward as the pathways, the power of art is just as limitless. It goes in all directions and is designed to constantly surprise. Tell a daydreaming Rahini teenager on his paper round that those steps would lead to a pathway which would lead to a year spent working right next to a dying but irrepressible David Bowie. In the morning at Enda's house, I noticed a portrait of him painted by the thin white duke himself. It got me thinking that they must have got close and that I should hold off any tender questions right till the end. Endings arrived with evening. Songbirds were singing. The post-Ophelia sky turned pink and the clock struck Ziggy. Our first, you know, few meetings together were, were really, because we talked really abstractly about what we wanted to make. I mean, he had four pages written of ideas. And then we sort of started talking about like, you know, the feeling of the ideas and started sending back and forth photo photographers that we liked and stuff like that. And we go, well, maybe the work should have that tone to it and, and all this sort of thing. And, and, then, and then we started talking about the sort of structure of the thing. And like, well, so, for, for, so for a good while we were, we were looking at stained glass, 
you know, windows and how the story of the stained glass window is sort of constructed a lot of the time. You know, you have a central sort of image and around it you have all these sort of scenes and, you know, like, and they're all like this sort of, like, carry on. And, 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 and David goes, I think it should be, or I said, oh, I think it should be sort of this, it should be sort of, that's our sort of, it should be structured in this sort of way. And he understood what I meant, but then he sent back, no, it should be structured in this way. And he sent me back a stained glass window that was completely shattered, like completely shattered. And he was going, it should be that, it should be that sort of broken and fucking, you know, like, you know, this sort of like carry on. And like, and anyone else in the room, and there were a couple of people in the room just thought we were maybe idiots or gibbering idiots, you know, and all that sort of carry on. But we had a sort of sense that we didn't want to make a literal piece of work. But we wanted to make a fever dream, you know, like, and we wanted to make it quite fucked and, you know, like, and all the rest. And, uh, and we felt very, um, very, you know, very, of course, very free. We were just going, well, that's just the way. And he goes, well, should we do that? And I was going, yeah, let's, we do whatever the fuck we all want to do. And, and um, so it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a wonderful sort of like, you know, funny collaboration to do, you know, like it was a fun time, I think, for both of us. And uh, uh, it just so happened that we were, we ended up writing a piece, well, it just, just so happened, but like we ended up writing a piece about dying, you know, and about a man who I guess can't die and then uh, this sort of Thomas Newton character from the Man Who Fell to Earth, you know, like this sort of like alien type but who who I, what I think really actually is ready to die, so it was there was that thing of like we used to talk a lot about you know well what the effects of morphine you know has on a person's head can we construct something based upon that you know like and, and how would a person sort of form a play or see the world if you know they have so much sort of morphine in them and all that type of thing how would they and that's what we ended up with this sort of trippy weird <laughs> weird thing you know like you know which you know for all his flaws was completely what we wanted to make. Yeah. And how close was that to, to his, to his demise? I, 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 I. I was at the time, so we were writing about that. So like, you were writing about that and like, you know, and he was, you know, as everyone said, that last year, he was just so energized. So he had a lot of, so he, he wrote four new tracks for the piece and, um, uh, but he had more, he was working on Black Star at the same time, you know, so he was like, I, I was like, oh my God, and he was just had so many songs. He was still like, you know, like, you know, the songs that he'd sent me that didn't make the, you know, that didn't make the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the cut, um, but like, but he still had all these fucking ideas. And also he wanted to, he wanted to work on another piece. So, it's, you know, I think when you're, when you know that, when you're ill and when you're sort of sick and, you know, you know, some people do have that sort of burst of creativity of just going. And here's a guy who, like, you know, just had so many tunes in him. But, but, <laughs> like, where, where, where does the? Can I ask? Where does, where does the sixteen-year-old Enda Walsh? How does he cope with? Oh, that. Boy, boy. You know, yeah. Well, you know, like, I mean, uh, what? It, I mean, is it like sitting on a desk like this? I yes, guess it is, right? It is. It's the same because people are exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. They are, you know, you forget really, really quickly is that, you know, that, that everyone is, you know, trying to make it up as they go along. Yeah. It's like, it's literally, it's all of that. It's, you know, but you meet people with the sort of similar energy and you think actually, yeah, we're going to do something together. And, but you completely forget about, well, I did completely forget about, of course, the body of work that, you know, like someone like him has made. And he, like, I for, forgot about that, that, but, that, like immediately until, you know, like we we're walking around moment together and then it was like, Oh God, yeah, I'm walking with Dave because people are looking at him and like, and you know, nearly having a heart attack. But he, he just, you know, he didn't care about any of that sort of thing. Of course, you know, he must have had an ego, you know, but he, he certainly didn't show it. And it was all just all about making it work. I mean, geez, he sounds like a beautiful man. I mean, it was the, I mean, the, the, his ability to keep the ego out of it. Obviously, he's yeah. so keen. Yeah. To, to, to get to the heart of what you, where you are. Yeah. And for that to, to merge into something that new or powerful yeah. or, or whatever. Yes. Extra to what he's yeah. done. Yeah. Like, isn't that, isn't that, have you, 
I mean, have you have you kind of grasped how inspiring that was? It is. No, I know I did. I did. I did. And you know, like I mean, like I'm learning how to sort of like you know, I've, well, what it does is sort of like you, you know, you, you know that of course you don't have the answers, and you're just trying to make something. And you're lucky enough to be sort of in a position to, to be allowed to make it. And you've got enough people around you who want to actually sort of like, who want to also want to fucking do that journey with you. And that's like really, really, really massively inspiring. And to do the work that he's done and realize that actually he's got to the end of his life and he's collaborated with so many fucking people, so many like great musicians and sort of artists and photographers and filmmakers and all the rest. And I really think that was just his bag. He just wanted to be sort of like, you know, Doing, doing stuff like that. I mean, what it says to me, and I'm the most fearful, afraid, like, scaredy cat in the whole world, but, like, it says, like, be not afraid. Yeah. There's, there's nothing to fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, exactly. And sort of like, I mean, the excitement and also the humility of just going, you know, like, actually, you're part of a team. I mean, like, you know, the last time I saw him was like, you know, like, when. And like we opened in New York and did it and all this sort of thing. And he went around to everyone in the theatre and thanked them, fucking staff and all fucking ushers and all that sort of thing. And he sat down and goes, "Did I thank everyone?" And I went, "Yeah, you know." And, you, and, and he said, "Okay, okay, okay." And he's like, I'm just, you know, I'm really in pain. And I sort of like, I thought, "Yeah, you're dying. You're not like you know, you're." But like, he wouldn't, you know, you know. It's sort of about, look, everyone okay? Is everyone all right? Do you know what I mean? Very special. I mean, yeah, very special. Jesus, because I mean, even in the most perfect health and the most perfect, like the person who's the most buzzed up and the happiest in the world, they might not want to go around and thank people. No. They wouldn't be asked. Couldn't no. be asked. Couldn't be asked. But yet, there's this person who is, who is, as you say, suffering and and then has is in pain and and yet is striving to to, to communicate. I that think it's gratitude. sort of like. I mean, I think I imagine like it's sort of there's something about like you know you you don't make work by yourself. You know, like it's sort of you need people around you, and it's sort of like it's, it's, it gives you energy. It gives you a reason to sort of live. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of it's you get, and you get to know them, and they become your sort of friends and sort of like you know, colleagues, and then friends, and da da. And you, you create like a body of work. You know, like and all that sort of thing. And it really is, I mean, that is, you cannot take that shit for granted. You know, it's sort of like it's very easy to, but like it, you, you just can't because that's. You know, it's important.